So I wonder how many of you have any kind of memory of this diagram. It was a whole, you know, uh, in 2020, that year, which we'd all like to be repressing from our memories right now. We went quite a ways through the topic of complex numbers before I pulled this one out. It wasn't complete at the time, by the way. Do you remember? It actually had a bunch of white boxes over some sections because I was like, hey, we've met a bunch of these ideas and they will go further in and uh, we're going to explore everything that this imaginary unit I unlocks for us. And it was quite a lot, right? Now I want you to recall, and it's down here, hmm, do you want to maybe, yeah, I usually, we love the fresh air, but maybe not if it's going to blow anyone over. Um, I wonder if you remember, down here in the bottom right hand corner, right, we started to explore some important ideas because we began with a complex number as a horizontal and vertical coordinate, so rectangular form. But then we went into mod arg form. Do you remember that? We also called it polar form, trigonometric form. And of course, what we were really laying the foundation for, modulus argument, what we were really laying the foundation for was numbers which have both direction and magnitude, right? Of course, that's not how it's actually said, but I, I, can't, I can't do a Jason Siegel impression. So, we, we reference briefly, hey, are there are these things called vectors. They can be very useful for you to geometrically think about these objects, complex numbers. But then we said, oh, okay, let's move on now, right? Let's go back into the rest of that complex number world. Polynomials, De Marvel's theorem, you recall, okay? And then where did you pick up from there? In extension one, you've been doing vectors and projection and dot products and all that kind of thing. Okay? Now within extension 2, and you can make this heading now if you like, we're going to extend that work into three dimensions. Three dimensional vectors. Now it is worth saying from the outset that a lot of what you learned in two dimensional vectors is just going to carry forward. You're going to learn about coordinate systems and dot products and project all that kind of stuff will be consistent. It's just like, well, we just put them on steroids. Now you've got extra unit vectors to worry about, right? So conceptually, a lot of that will feel familiar. However, I know that from when I learned this, it was quite a cognitive load actually, just to go from two dimensions to three. Despite the fact that we all live in three dimensions, the mathematics of it is actually quite complicated. So today what we're going to do is just get our minds into the frame of thinking in three dimensions, which I know sounds strange because like I said, we live in them. But how do we represent this? Go ahead and draw yourself a Cartesian plane. You might notice I've only got a quarter of a Cartesian plane here and you'll see why in a second. In order to go from a Cartesian plane to a 3D coordinate system that's very similar to our Cartesian plane, we have this huge limitation which is that the things we're going to work within, the space we're working within is, well, mostly for all of us I'm pretty sure, flat, right? It's a two-dimensional object that you're going to be drawing three-dimensional things on, okay? So we want to make sure we lay our groundwork and our foundations really, really firmly because we're going to build a heck of a lot on it, okay? Here's the first mind twist. X and Y. We're very used to thinking of as horizontal and vertical, okay? But in three dimensions, you can think about this in many different ways, but there's a conventional way you're going to see more uh, often than anything else, and here's how it's going to look. Pens out of hands, eyes up for a second, and just watch carefully what's going to happen to my XY plane. The conventional way for representing three dimensions, the conventional way, not the only way, but the conventional way, is to take this XY plane and imagine placing it flat on the ground. Okay, which is kind of nice for you because you're like, well, mine, mine is flat on a table, right? So you can see X is now coming toward you as it were, and then Y is heading up there. So if you imagine sort of standing over it, but from this side, right, that's why Y used to be up. Do you see from where I'm standing, Y is going up, as it were, okay? Now if that's where X and Y are on a flat horizontal plane, where is Z going to go? And you can see based on where I've put this, you can point your finger in the right direction, right? It's going to go up. So the conventional way that we would think of the new Z axis is that's our new up. Y used to be up, but now Z is up, okay? Go ahead and beside your Cartesian plane, draw yourself one of these, okay? Now, this is part of the reason why, by the way, I only drew a quarter of the Cartesian plane before. I could have done all four quadrants, but when you go into three dimensions, it starts to get a bit trickier. 
Now I'm just going to borrow my board for a second. We will get to this on the computer shortly, but if you had this thing going off into your three directions and you imagine these continuing, like at the moment I've just got the positive x-axis, the positive y-axis, and the positive z-axis. As you move into negative x and negative y and negative z, our 3D space is not divided into four quadrants, it's actually divided into, now think about it for a second, think about what would be the equivalent of a quadrant in this three dimensions. I'm just going to give you a clue, I'm showing you only one of them right now, only one quadrant is visible, positive, 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 for x, y and z. They're actually not quadrants at all because there's not four. How many sections have I divided up 3D space into? Can you see them? I've actually done, count them, eight, right? If you think about it this way, I'm actually just going to go backwards, right? If you think about, we have the XY plane, right? And then when you put it flat on the ground, it's still now dividing into four if I had the negative parts as well. Do you agree with that? So there's just four. And then what I do when I put Z through it is, now there's a top and a bottom. There's a top four and a bottom four. So instead of calling them quadrants, because that would give you four, what's our prefix to do with eight? Oct. So these are called octants, right? You've got eight octants that are represented. I've only just shown you one of them, okay? Now, we need to get a better handle on this. And as you can see, I've been working with this flat space and it's quite tricky. So what I'm going to try and do is put you into three dimensions. Now, I highly encourage you in the same way that Mrs. Lees and I have frequently used Desmos to do lots of functions and graphing and geometry with you. If you want to work in three dimensions, GeoGebra is where you want to go. Okay. And if you just Google, maybe you want to jot this down now, 3D GeoGebra, you'll turn up this tool. If you just do regular GeoGebra, it starts out in 2D. We want to start out in 3D. Okay. So here's the same kind of thing. Uh, red is X, green is Y, blue is Z. So far, same thing that we had over here. Let's add in our other directions. So let's go with, let's put in the negative X. Can you see what I've just put in there? Right, it's going into the screen, whereas X, positive X was coming out at you. Okay, you can see if I now put on, let's get Y. It's going to go to the left, where positive Y was going to the right. And then lastly, where's positive, or rather negative Z going to go? It's going to go down, because you drew, uh, you told me to draw positive Z up. So of course negative Z would be down. Okay. Now, this leads to a bunch of implications. For example, um, if you have a think about, uh, let's, uh, let's go back to our Cartesian plane. You've got your Cartesian plane still there, right? Do you have them separate? You've got the two, okay? Really simple trivial thing, humor me, okay? On this Cartesian plane, can you please draw for me x equals five? x equals five, what does that look like? And in fact, once you've drawn it, can you hold it up for me? Just so I've got an indication of how many of you have it ready. If you had your Cartesian plane there, this should take all of two seconds. Okay, I've got one, I've got, come on, hold them up. I've got one so far out of, hold it up a bit closer for me. Okay, I've got something there, good. Fantastic, all right, hold them up a bit higher for me. Interesting, interesting. Okay, thank you, hands down, or oh, books down rather, all right. This is actually not entirely what I expected. I got about a 50-50 split. Several of you have done this, drawn that as x equals 5. Now I don't disagree, I don't disagree, I don't disagree that that is x equals 5. However, I would say a more accurate way of saying this is that's x equals 5 on a number line. Do you agree? On a number line there's only one, one and only one place that can claim the name x equals 5. But on the plane there's a whole bunch of places that can say I'm x equals 5. Where else can you go? It can go up and down, right? In fact, x equals 5, if you haven't included this already, is this whole vertical line, okay? What does x equals 5, I've already kind of flagged it by saying this is what it is on a number line, this is what it is on a number plane, what would it look like, x equals 5, in three dimensions? What do you think, Calvin? If we go up in dimensions, right? Here's my... Um, Think about this for a second. This point, it's a zero-dimensional object 
on a one-dimensional space. Stay with me, it's a bit weird, right? This line is a one-dimensional object in a two-dimensional space, yes? x equals 5 is a two-dimensional space, sorry, yes, in, in a three-dimensional space. Does that make sense? Everything on that, let's rotate this around so you can see it a bit more easily. Everything on that sheet, on that surface, can say my x value is 5, right? The y value can change, which is why I can move now across the green direction. My z value can change, which is why I can go up and down in the blue direction, okay? But I'm only locked in at x equals 5. And of course, as you change whatever value you want, you're moving your plane back and forth in the x direction. Make sense? Just like if I change this to x equals 4, 3, 2, 1, you'd be moving it in the x direction, yeah? Okay, this is really important because some of the language we've been using in 2D vectors comes into here, right? Have a think about this. If I say I've got uh, x equals 5, what's its relationship? There's this very particular word that you learn in 2D vectors that re relates the x equals 5 line to the x axis. What's the word? It starts with an O. It's a new word. Orthogonal is our fancy extension 1 word for what word would we have used in like year 7 and 8 to describe these two lines? Orthogonal means perpendicular, right? Now the reason why we introduce this new word, orthogonal, is because perpendicular strictly is only speaking about lines. You can only have a line and another line perpendicular to each other. And orthogonality is about what if you have other things, like, you know, surfaces and planes, right? So this is the important thing, and you need to have this, and this is going to be tricky, I know, but this you want to try and represent on your diagram, right? Here's my x equals 5 plane. In exactly the same way that the x equals 5 line is perpendicular to the x-axis, the x equals 5 plane is orthogonal. Do you see it? I've tried to draw that right angle in black, right? It's orthogonal to the x-axis. Are you with me? Now, um, I was at uni when I first discovered the word orthogonal. It wasn't in the syllabus before. And I remember puzzling over it and not really ever understanding what it meant. And I literally, Mrs. Lee's actually saw it, maybe heard it happen um, earlier today. It only just now clicked for me why this word is what it is. Is anyone here obsessed with etymology, like where words come from, anyone? Okay, I hope you're gonna benefit out of this, okay? Orthogonal, uh, that suffix, gone, right? Where have you seen that before in geometry? What words end in gone? Shapes, Shapes right? Like? Polygons, pentagons, hexagons, octagons, not quadragons, but anyway, you get the idea, right? The gone means angle. That's what that means, right? Now, I don't know how many of you are like me in that you have or had braces. I had braces. Hands up if you ever had or still have braces. Hands up straight. <laughs> okay. Few of you, I'm glad for the majority of you who have never experienced this, okay? As the people with their hands up know, not the most fun experience. But all of you who raise your hands, and maybe those of you who didn't, can tell me who's the person you see to get braces put in. It's an orthodontist, right? What's an orthodontist's job? Their job is to get your teeth, your dentition, your dental things, to get them right. Because they're all weird and jagged and in the wrong spot. And I actually, fun fact, I had a tooth coming out of the roof of my mouth, like right out of the middle. And I said to my mom when I was 12, I was like, Mom, there's a tooth coming out of the middle of my mouth. And she was like, no, there's not. And I was like, no, really. And six months later, I said, Mom, this tooth is getting really big. And she, she looked at it and she's like, whoa, you have a tooth coming out of your mouth. And I was like, I know. And orthodontists fixed that. They got my teeth right. So tell me, please tell me, what does orthogonal actually just mean? Right. right angled. That's all it means, okay? 